we're going to get into our first uh, teaching the this afternoon, because I know that uh, is one thing you've been waiting for. And I have the privilege of introducing to you a, uh, a man I consider to be a friend of mine. We haven't known each other for a long time, but as soon as we met, there was an instantaneous connection. At least that's from my part. I can't speak for him, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the feeling is mutual because we've had some wonderful conversations. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Phil Giliotti, uh, see, I know a Dr. Phil too, and I really <laughs> like what this guy has to say. Um, Phil is, uh, um, he is actually a medical doctor and uh, he practiced for 40 years, lives with his wife, Joan, in the Cleveland, Ohio area. Uh, Phil has been involved in messianic ministry uh, since dirt new, I think, or something like that. Uh, been around for a long time, and I had a, the privilege of uh, interviewing him on the Superheroes for the Messianic Lifestyle uh, broadcast that I do on Monday nights at six o'clock here on Lamb Network. And just getting to hear his story was uh, was so exciting and amazing. Um, Phil does a show here on Lamb Network. And it's called One in Messiah. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> he's also been speaking to Messianic congregations. You actually speak uh, and minister to Messianic synagogues over in Israel, too. Have uh, done a lot of work, mission work in Mexico City for many, many years. And uh, the list goes on and on. And uh, you are also uh, a board member of Paul Wilbur's ministry. So um it's a good thing you don't have to put all this on a business card because it would be too big <laughs> to, have to carry around but uh bill it is uh such a pleasure to be able to share uh, this day with you and uh, i'm really excited to hear about what you've got to share with us because your message is going to be on the cost of discipleship and i think that's something that everybody uh needs to understand <clears throat> Um, I think some people have this idea of missions being um, a glamorous thing that, you know, you come to Yeshua and all of your problems get solved. And uh, I think the reality is a little bit different. So why don't you take it from there? Well, thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, I'm honored that you got to introduce me. And I'm especially honored and thankful to Debbie and Phil. Uh, Basara Institute, and of course, Mark Smith and Lamb Network. And um, my show on Lamb has been on now since this past February, uh, Thursdays at four, and it's just been delightful to do that. And it's, I, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to be with this group of speakers in this kind of a forum because I was, I was just telling my wife earlier, you know, I'm, I'm one of the amateurs and you guys have all been doing this for decades. And it's just such a thrill for me. And I, I have the honor of teaching many Bible studies and having a, um, live version of one in Messiah. Uh, if you are in the Cleveland, Ohio area, we meet at 709 Brook Park road in uh, Brooklyn Heights, Ohio. And so uh, anytime you could join us, that, that would be awesome. But since we're talking about being called out and being the um, body of Mashiach, I think that this is such a incredibly important issue in our day, because for the last, as, as you mentioned, Rabbi Weinberg, toward the end there, I don't know, I've only been a believer since 1995, but it seems to me that over the last at least 20 to 30 years, we've gotten into what I call easy Christianity. And we've gotten into, hey, it shouldn't be any work for us. It shouldn't be any problem for us. We should be just kind of going on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, you know, your average church on Sunday morning and we should be playing a few really good songs and we should hear an uplifting message that doesn't challenge us in any way, uh, builds up our self-esteem, 
gives us a good feeling. And then we have what I call high five Jesus, where we say, yeah, Jesus loves me. I love him and high five. And I said the prayer 14 years ago. So we're all set. And that's become 21st century Christianity. We live in a world now where the Judeo-Christian morality has been almost completely eliminated and aggressively now is being more and more of it being eliminated. And we see, in my opinion, what uh, Paul wrote about called the great falling away to the Thessalonians, because we have experienced the great falling away. And it's the, the, like I often say on Friday nights, nobody goes to more churches than I do, but it's very difficult nowadays to go to a church and hear about sin and repentance. It's very difficult to hear about the gospel. And obviously I go to churches that, that do, that do preach the gospel, but it's hard to hear about the gospel anywhere anymore because there's no concept of sin and repentance. Everybody's good. Everybody's fine. We have to be nice. And like, um, someone I respect always says, you know, we've become the church of nice. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to stand with everyone and everyone's welcome. Everyone's acceptable. We don't want to put any challenges. We don't want to be judgmental and so forth. And this is where we are in the 21st century. And as you see in our society, things are, um, degenerating to the point where even not only is the gospel not out in the community, not only is Judeo-Christian morality out in the community, but now we're even rebelling against natural law. The rebellion is so bad. And like Yeshua said, before the son of man comes, it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Lot. In another passage, he says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? What a powerful statement. Because when I was growing up, you know, everybody went to some kind of a church. I didn't know any Jewish believers, but everybody went to some kind of a church and everybody knew kind of the fundamentals of Christianity, the foundations of the faith. And now you have to be at least 50 years of age to really have been raised in those on those foundations for the most part obviously not everyone <clears throat> but this is the situation that we're in to the fact now that the gospel has been hijacked even by the church no one even knows what the gospel is anymore it could be anything from recycling and reducing your carbon footprint to tolerating everything, being nice to everyone, accepting everyone, having some code of conduct that if you do the best you can, you'll somehow end up in heaven. And the God I believe in would never send anybody to hell. The God I believe in is not judgmental because I've made him in my own image. And when you make God in your own image, he's very easy to control because you control his attributes. And as a final point to this, this is introduction, of course. So the final point of this is when I witness to people who question me about these things, I always say to them, Adam and Eve took one bite of an apple and mankind fell. And this is why we die, and this is why we get sick, and this is why we get old, and this is why we have disease, and this is why we have war, and this is why we have anger, and this is why we have all the things that you see going on. But we live in a world where we think God will overlook everything that we do, everything that the society does. And it can't be possible. All of the Bible, all the books of the Bible came into existence because Adam and Eve fell, and as the only solution to the sin problem, Messiah, the God-man, had to come and be the perfect sacrifice. And if you notice in the culture, that's not tolerated. If you want to talk about Buddha on TV, oh, 
That'd be great. Everybody will fall all over you. You want to talk about Krishna? Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. You can have the Dalai Lama on your talk show and, oh, what a great man. What a man of peace. But you start to talk about Yeshua, you start to talk about Jesus, the whole temperament of the place changes because that we can't have. And so since we are in this situation now, we have to go back to what he told us <clears throat> when he was here in the flesh about what it means to be a follower, what it means to have metanoia. You know, the New Testament word for repentance, of course, as you know, is metanoia. It has the impression of changing the direction of your life in the sense of walking one way, and then you stop and you turn and you walk in the opposite way, 180 degrees from where you were. That's repentance. That's what's giving your life to the Lord means. It doesn't mean that when you're 15, you went to the front, you said the prayer, you signed a card, somebody gave you a Bible, and now you're 90 and you haven't really done anything since. So we're going to go back and talk about how Yeshua himself looked at this, how he looked at discipleship. And so much of the, the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, is about following and is about being a disciple. And I can't possibly cover all the scriptures because those of you that know me will know that, that would, I would be here all afternoon talking about that. And I'm going to cover kind of, um, I don't want to say the highlights, but kind of a summary that is going to come from a passage of Luke's gospel, chapter 9, if you want to flip through that or click on it or whatever it is you do. But the uh, the scripture will be up on the on the um, PowerPoint as well. So as we start, I want you to keep in mind one thing: what I said about the current state of the church, where even the leadership of many churches is abandoning the faith. I never thought I would see this in my lifetime but it's happening. And before I start with the biblical passages, keep in mind that the word disciple has the same root as the word discipline. There is nothing, nothing in the scripture about do whatever you can, do whatever you want. God helps those who helps themselves. Do the best you can. Jesus accepted everybody. Don't worry. Everything's cool. And so as we go into these passages, I want you to think about the fact that he laid out some groundwork for discipleship. So let's start with what's the call to discipleship? Everyone knows what the Great Commission is. Everyone quotes the Great Commission. Everyone knows about the Great Commission. There have been thousands of books written about the Great Commission. There's probably been millions of sermons over 2,000 years about the Great Commission. But let's talk about the core of this. And we're going to use Matthew's account, which is in Matthew 28. We're going to, we're going to get to Luke 9 in a minute. But Matthew 28, starting in at verse 18. And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All authority was given to him. Now I'm giving you a command to go out and to make disciples not to just tell people about me not to well if my name comes up you might want to explain a little bit or uh, i you know i no pressure on you guys i don't i don't, I don't want you to feel any pressure whatsoever only if you feel like doing it you might talk about me once in a while you might talk about me once in a while no he says you're going to make disciples you're going to make disciplined 
learners. The word disciple the, in the Greek connotate, has a strong connotation of a learner, someone who is learning, someone who is advancing. You know, Paul talks about milk. And when you're an infant, you have to have milk. A two-month-old baby cannot live on anything but milk. And so if you picture, if you put a, a dish in front of a two-month-old baby that has on it a steak and a baked potato and some asparagus, nothing much is going to happen. If you tried to force it in his mouth, nothing much is going to happen. But if you had a 10-year-old who was only living on milk, that would be abnormal. If you had a 50-year-old who was only living on milk, that would be grossly abnormal. Because as you progress in life, you develop, you have a more complex nutrition as you grow. Paul says, when you come to the Lord, you're like an infant on milk, but you don't stay on the milk. You advance the learning. You advance the contemplation. You advance the prayer life. You get deeper into the relationship. It isn't just the bottle of milk and go to sleep anymore like it was when you were an infant. So he says in the Great Commission, you're going to make disciples. You're going to make learners. <clears throat> Does he say just in this little area where we are or, well, within 100 miles of here? No. He says all nations. When the Bible talks about nations, it's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about the Goyim. He says, you're going to go out to the nations to make disciples. And then he even gives a pretty strong indication of the triune nature of God. He says, you're going to baptize them. It doesn't say, he doesn't say in the names of, he says in the name singular of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is a pretty, pretty powerful command. Then he goes on to say, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. Teaching them to observe what I've commanded you. Not let them do whatever they want. Let them think whatever they want. Make whatever kind of dogmas they want to make for themselves. Make whatever kind of image or revelation of me they feel like having teach and observe the things that i have commanded you and if you do that i'll be with you until the end of the age you know the old translations used to say end of the world <clears throat> which was clearly wrong it's the end of the age we're not going to get into greek and hebrew and maybe rabbi uh, weinberg can chime in on that later but um if you follow the things that I've commanded you, I'll be with you. The Greek word there that's used means to teach, to make a disciple, to make a learner, to make a scholar. You know, the Greek philosophers, as you know, had students who gathered around them at their schools. They had schools of philosophy. And as you know, from your Greek history, there were many different branches of philosophy and they attracted different types of students who studied under a professor. So if you were, if you got accepted to, to Plato's Academy, you went there and sat while Plato taught and you absorbed as much knowledge as you could. You were a learner, you were a scholar. And the tense of the Greek verb there means that it's an active imperative thing. It isn't a suggestion. It is that this might happen once in a while. It doesn't mean, oh, in the past it happened, <clears throat> but doesn't happen anymore. It's active and it's imperative. You make disciples, you make disciples. So in the first century, I mean, if this is the year 33, let's say, and we don't know exactly, but let's say it is the year 33, it doesn't mean that by the year 65 or maybe by the year 90, this was pretty much wrapped up. This goes on and on and on through the 2000 years of the, the Christian era into our time where the original 
and I had a word from the Holy Spirit a few years ago about this, that we are just as important here today as the evangelists of the first century were, because they went out into a pagan world and brought in the first harvest. We that are here now are again going into a pagan world, bringing in the final harvest. So we have a very important mission to teach, to make scholars, to make disciples in an active, imperative way. And that's where we are today. We are living, and I know everybody's going to sit home going, what do you mean pagan world? I go to church almost every Sunday. Oh, what do you mean? I got, I don't know, I got a Bible in my house. Well, the society we live in has become pagan and is becoming more pagan by the month, by the week. And you don't have to go very far when you watch TV or you watch news or you watch the entertainment industry, how far we've gone in a relatively short amount of time. Because now, like I said, we have easy Christianity. We're, we have fans, you know, we have people that think Jesus was awesome. He was really good. He's a great teacher was a complete pacifist though. You know, he would never raise his voice. He would never judge anyone. He would never encourage any kind of pressure on anyone. He was just, you know, this complete pacifist and we're kind of fans of his. We like his teaching and we like to hear a little bit more about him once in a while. <clears throat> it kind of supplements my life. You know, if I have a little more Jesus in my life, eh, it's probably better than it was before. And, you know, after all, I said the prayer, I'm all set. So there's nothing else that I have to do. I can listen to people on TV telling me how he wants me to be rich, how he wants me to be successful, how he wants me to accumulate material things. And hey, this is, this is the kind of Jesus I want to know. This is my kind of church. There's all these other streams of Christianity and scriptures being rewritten, reinterpreted, because now we put ourselves in a position of saying, we have evolved to this point where we can question, we can challenge, and worst of all, we can change it. We can change it to suit our needs. Health is our need. We want to be healthy. A good friend of mine always uses the passage from 2 Corinthians that says we are clay vessels with glory inside. But Satan always wants us to think about the clay vessel. Oh, you're tired. Oh, you don't feel good. Oh, you have a runny nose today. Oh, your foot hurts. You better just stay home and get some rest. You know, forget about the Jesus stuff for a couple of days. You got to take care of yourself. Make sure you take your pills. Make sure you do whatever you have to do. Because we want health and wealth. We want to feel good 100% of the time. Because we have power within us to do these things that no other people in human history have had. So before the Great Commission, of course, back in Matthew 16, he had made another statement. And we're, I promise we're going to get to Luke 9. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Okay, here we go. Prosperity preachers probably don't quote this verse. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. It's not about us. We're used powerfully to preach the gospel. We're used powerfully to minister to people, to develop their spirituality, to, to help them advance in their thinking, to help them advance in understanding scripture, of understanding the revelations 
of understanding how the plan of salvation unwinds through all of the scripture. But it isn't about us. We have to deny ourselves. And you can look all through history of how this affected people, not just people in the first century. There were many martyrs in the first century. But in the 20th century, there were more martyrs than all the other centuries combined. And the 21st century, I'm sure, isn't doing that much better. So you have to deny yourself, not about you. You follow Yeshua, you don't know where you might end up. You might end up in a prison. You might end up in a work camp in China. You might end up preaching in Beverly Hills. You might end up preaching in Twinsburg, Ohio. You don't know where you're going to end up because it's not about you. And then he says, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Now, we know about crosses because, well, crosses are everywhere. Not just on church buildings, but we wear them as jewelry. We have them up in our house. People you know, are familiar with crosses. The people of Yeshua's time felt differently about crosses because this was the instrument of execution. When he says, take up your cross and follow me, we think, oh yeah, you know, I should go to church. I should fast once in a while. Maybe once in a while, I should spend 15 minutes studying the scriptures. I don't know. When they heard this, they thought execution. When somebody picks up a cross and goes down the road, passing you on the street, one thing you know is you're not going to ever see that person again because they're being taken to their death. They're being taken to their execution. The old you, as Paul says, has been crucified with Jesus. The old you is on the cross. The condemnation due to you is nailed to the cross. The old you has been crucified. So the old you doesn't live anymore. So if you pick up your cross and follow me, then you're going to be the disciple. Then you're going to be the teacher. Then you're going to form other scholars. Then you're going to understand these plans. And if you don't, I mean, I, I have to tell you, from personal experience, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but practicing medicine for 40 years has shown me the whole scope of humanity, I can assure you. And one huge thing of the, of the latter half of my years practicing was the fact that you could tell a person in the office that their cholesterol was four points higher than it was six months ago, and they would literally start crying and carrying on about how horrible, but have no concern about the fact that they stand condemned before an all just, all holy God because they're sinners. So here Yeshua says, if you gain all the stuff in this world and you lose your soul, what good does it do you? So he's talking about real discipleship that is not about you. It's a call to discipline, to learning, to following to surrendering. When you say, well, I gave my heart to Jesus, you don't really mean that. You mean you sort of did, and I include myself. We all do that. Well, you know, he can have half of it or 60% of it, but some of it I want to kind of keep because I kind of like some of this. And I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be told what to do about every aspect of my life. But it involves surrender. We don't like to surrender. Even the people in the wilderness didn't like to surrender, despite all that they saw. So we are a people that are set apart. We're a people that are set apart. Peter talks about this, and in the Tanakh, the, the, the prophets talk about this, and in the Torah, it talks about this. And I'm going to use one quick example which is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, the chosen people, the Israelites, are taken out of Egypt 
They're brought through the wilderness. They're provided for for 40 years. They're taken to the land of milk and honey. God warns them in the book of Deuteronomy <clears throat> not to have a king. He's their king. You are different than all the other people on the earth. You are my inheritance. You are not to be like the other people around you. You don't marry them. You don't do business with them. And worst of all, you don't go to church with them. You don't go to their temples with them. You're set apart. You're my inheritance. Gets to 1 Samuel 8. We want a king. We want a king. Why? Because we want to be like everybody else. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. You're a people set apart. You're my special possession. Even though the whole earth is mine, you are a special possession. They wanted a king to be like everybody else. We're the body of Messiah. We've been called out, which is the theme of this conference. We've been called out to be the body of Messiah. We are not supposed to be like everybody else. We are not supposed to be the church of nice. We are supposed to be evangelizing the world, evangelizing the culture, bringing salvation to people, even if it means rejection from the world. We're not supposed to be here so that the world likes us better. We can't tell the world, oh, we're really not any different than you guys. Oh, oh no, 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 we're not carried away or anything by this Jesus stuff. We want to be just like you guys. We, 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 we want, you know, we don't want you to think we're kooks. We don't want you to think we're different. We want to be just like you guys. And that's what's happening today. The church is falling over itself, trying to be more and more like the world. And we are to be a people that are set apart. Set apart just like Israel was. We are set apart in, in, in such a powerful way because it involves every tribe, every language, every race, all over the world, all of the nations. Now let's get into Luke, <laughs> finally. We're going to start in 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Hey, what's he talking about here? He's talking about this is the his Passover. This is his last Pesach. This is the Pesach where he's to be the lamb. He's to be the unblemished, perfect lamb. He's to have his blood put on the door, so to speak. He is here to atone for sin by the shedding of his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. I tell that to enough of your friends who will say, what in the world are you talking about? How does the fact that someone who was executed 2,000 years ago apply to me? Come on. That's crazy. I'm a really good person. I've never killed anybody. I go to work. I take care of my kids. I do the best I can. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew this was his physical end <clears throat> in the sense of he was going to the cross. And he did it steadfastly. Because he knew this is what had to be done. That this was the only way that salvation could come. That this was the only way that the sin problem could be solved. So he steadfastly sets his face. He's going to Jerusalem. Passover, of course, was one of the three pilgrimage feasts. So at Passover, he has to end up in Jerusalem anyway. And all the sacrifices had to be in Jerusalem. And that included his. His face was set. And then as he's going toward Jerusalem, he tells a story about three people. And this is finally what this talk is really about. He tells a story about three people, starting in verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. 
And Yeshua said to him, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, that's a strange answer. Here comes this guy who is um, really excited to follow. He's really eager. I want to follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go, I'm, I'm there. You know, it's like Peter saying, oh, Lord, you can't count on these guys. But, oh, man, me, I'm going to go in. I'm going to die with you. I'll do this. I got I'm ready to go. And then two, three hours later, it was Jesus who? I don't know any Jesus. So this is a guy who gets a very strange answer from Yeshua after saying something that seems good. He's very eager, but he doesn't understand the possible costs. He doesn't understand that there's going to be suffering. He doesn't understand he may not even have the basic necessities of life. I'm going to follow you, but, you know, I haven't thought this out, but I'm coming. I'm eager. I want to do this. Well, have you considered that the birds and the foxes have places to live? And I don't. And you may not either. Are you concerned that maybe the, um, um, you, may not, you may not even have a place to lay your head at night? You may be laying your head at night in a prison. I don't know if many of you know about Watchman Ni, nee, the great Chinese preacher and evangelist who spent 20 years in a communist Chinese prison for preaching the gospel. And most of that time was in solitary confinement. And they took away all his books and they took away even his Bible and they took away all the stuff he had. And he had a bench that he slept on, that he sat on, a hole in the middle of the cell. And when they finally went in to kind of, he died, I think he died there, but when they finally went in to kind of get it ready for the next guy, all they found was a bench that on the side of the bench, he had, he had chiseled in Jesus as Lord, somehow carved it into the side of the bench. This is all he had in solitary confinement in a Chinese prison camp. And we complain about going to church if it's raining. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time to study the Bible. The kids have 18 events every Saturday and Sunday that we have to be at. Our jobs are pressure. We don't have time to do anything else. This guy's very eager to do it. <clears throat> but he doesn't understand. He may not even have the basic necessities. The foxes and the birds have them. But Yeshua himself doesn't have them. He didn't own anything. Maybe his clothes. And on the accounts from the crucifixion, you know, where the soldiers gambled for his robe or tunic or whatever it was. That's probably the only thing that he owned. He even had to borrow a donkey for Palm Sunday. In order to fulfill Zechariah 9.9, he had to borrow a donkey. He didn't have the basic necessities. So this first man who wants to follow doesn't get that this may actually apply to him. Poverty is involved. It may not be, but it may be. You may be a follower and have tons of material blessing, and that's great. And you may use that material blessing to advance the kingdom. That's great. But Yeshua did not have that. He didn't promise that to everyone. Because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, through his poverty, we are rich. And having, as, as uh, Rabbi Weinberg mentioned, my wife, Joan, and I have done did many, many years ministering in Mexico City garbage dumps, literally inhabited garbage dumps, not landfills, garbage dumps with mounds of garbage. Yeshua came from the glories and beauty of heaven 
to living in a garbage dump. And I got to tell you, even if you do get sent to Beverly Hills and you live in a what appears to be an opulent place, you are living in a garbage dump. So through his poverty, we become rich. And it's interesting, too, that Yeshua refers to himself as the son of man. You know, through the whole Gospels, he calls himself the son of man many, many, many times. Maybe more than any other title. I'm not sure. I never really counted it up. Some of you probably know. But he calls himself the son of man. He's the flesh and blood son of Adam. Flesh and blood. In Hebrews it says he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Because we're also flesh and blood descendants of Adam. And he's the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. I love teaching about Abraham because... The last promise, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through you, 75-year-old man who's living in present-day Iraq, who doesn't have any children, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And here we are in the 21st century, living in northern Ohio or wherever you're living, those of you that are watching, we're still talking about Abraham. And we're blessed by the promise to Abraham because Yeshua is his descendant. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, it got people pretty upset. But it's a fulfillment of that promise. And he calls himself the son of man. He says, put aside the things of the world, deny yourselves, carry your cross, and expect that you're going to have tribulation. This doesn't mean once in a while you're going to have a bad day. Or once in a while, you might get a cold and not feel good, but it'll go away real fast. No, he says, you're going to have tribulation. And you have to be ready for it. Then he said to another, follow me. Now he asks somebody to follow him. So he calls another one. <clears throat> you know, in John's gospel, in chapter 15, he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Here he comes to this man and says, follow me. I love the calling of the apostles that is at the beginning of John's gospel because Nathaniel is my favorite, but all of them, it's just so cool to come and see, to come and see. So he says, come and follow me. He calls this guy personally, but he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you Go and preach the kingdom of God. Ooh, this sounds really harsh. Really harsh. Coming from what everybody pictures as a pacifist, meek and mild Jesus. Said, let the dead bury their dead. You go preach the gospel of the kingdom. You go preach the kingdom. Well, why does he say that? Let me bury my father. Well, first of all, this guy's putting his family needs ahead of the gospel putting his family needs ahead of Yeshua. And in the context of the language there, his father wasn't dead yet. His father was still alive. Which means he's saying, I can't do it now. But maybe when, and we can fill in our own things. Oh, my kids are grown up. When I'm retired. When I've got enough money in the bank when I'm pretty secure and pretty set and pretty sure that everything is okay, then maybe I'll follow. Then maybe I'll go tell somebody about you. I'll go someplace and preach the gospel. But not right now, this, this couldn't come at a worse time. I got all the stuff going on at work. You have no idea, Lord, what tomorrow's going to be like at my office. You have no idea the mountain of paperwork I have to go through. And you have no idea how many events I have to take the kids to tomorrow. Can't do it now, but maybe at some other time, I'll be excited to do it. So then he says, let the spiritually dead bury the spiritually dead. <clears throat> the spiritually dead people are going to be dead. They're going to take care of burying themselves. You don't worry about it. That's not going to be what you're here for. 
You're here to make sure they're not spiritually dead. And he re Yeshua rejects this excuse. He says, go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the kingdom. It's not about you. It's not about your needs. He's not telling the guy, like when he says, if you don't hate your mother and father, you can't be my disciple. He doesn't want you to hate your mother and your father. This is using hyperbole, as you know, which was a common Hebrew way of teaching. But what he's saying is, I am more important than all that. I'm more important than your mountain of paperwork. I'm more important than your father. I'm more important than whatever softball game your daughter has tomorrow. Go and preach the kingdom. Die to yourself. This is what's urgent. So he doesn't accept the guy's excuse. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell who are at my house. But Yeshua said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> another strange answer. Another harsh answer. Here's another man. I'll follow, but first, I got to go home and say bye to everybody. Well, that's a very reasonable thing to do. I don't think any of us would undertake some big thing like this and not go home and tell everybody. But think about all the things that would happen is, why does he say it's unfit? So he says, all this guy wants to do is go home. He's distracted by the worldly things. He's distracted by his family. He may go home and say, hey, mom and dad and brother and sister, I just met this traveling rabbi. He's a really powerful teaching teacher. I've decided I'm going to follow him the rest of my life. And that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to be leaving and I'm going to be on the road with this man. And if your son came home and said that to you, picture this guy's parents. You're going to do what? You're going to go where? With whom? A guy who's walking around with some students who doesn't even seem to have a job or do anything practical? You're going to go hang around with him? You better rethink this, son, because this sounds pretty silly. And we all would say that. This doesn't sound like a good life plan. We may be tempted not to follow. But he makes it clear that the gospel is urgent. The preaching the kingdom is urgent. It's more important than these other things. Then he talks about the plow. I love this part. You know, he's not talking about like when you're driving down I-71 or 77 and you see these beautiful farms and the green tractors going along, you know, plowing the field or harvesting or doing whatever. This picture shows what plowing was like. It was a wooden plow. There were animals that were hooked to it with a yoke and a whatever it's called. And the guy, the man who is plowing his field is literally strapped to the machine, the machine, to the to the plow. He literally becomes part of the unit. And so the point of the plow is that as the animals go forward, the bottom of the plow makes a furrow in the ground. Believe it or not, they used wood. Now, granted, the soil in Israel is much softer than the soil in Ohio. <laughs> but we got a lot of clay here. And they didn't use a metal tip on the plow till. I don't know, 1700s or something, believe it or not. So a furrow is made by this plow with the guy looking forward and the animals pulling. Now he has his, fit, uh, his eyes set in front of him. Now, what happens if he looks back? If he looks back, then 
the animals kind of go to one side or the other. He's not really controlling the plow. He's kind of, you know, going like this, and he's making a furrow that looks like this. And people go by the road on the side of the field and say, man, some drunk guy must have plowed that field. Look at that. <clears throat> it looks ridiculous. So what Yeshua was saying, you keep your eyes fixed on him, like the writer to the Hebrews tells us, Paul tells us, you keep your eyes fixed on the prize. You keep your eyes fixed on him and your work will go in that direction. But once you start turning around and say, gee, I don't know, maybe I made a mistake with this Yeshua stuff. You know, maybe I should have listened to my parents. I don't know. They were pretty upset. Pretty soon your furrow goes all out of whack. He says, if you put your hands to the plow and look back, you're not worthy to be his disciple because you're looking back toward the world. Oh, I kind of liked when I was doing that. Oh, I kind of liked that other thing over there. Oh, you know, man, maybe I got a little carried away with this. You can't plow. You can't do the work if you're looking backwards. <clears throat> so we're called to do these things. And we're weak and we're frail. And we, we can't even, we don't even know how weak and frail we are. Unless you really sit back and think about how you respond to things that happen in your life, how you how what your prayer life prayer life is like, et cetera, et cetera. How do we stay focused on these things? How do you keep your eyes forward? How do you keep your eyes on the prize? And of course, we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the ruach, the ruach, ruach in Hebrew, of course can mean spirit, can mean breath, it can mean wind. That's so cool. So just like creation is spoken out by the breath of God, Paul tells Timothy, the scripture is breathed out by God, the Holy Spirit. And he emboldens us, empowers us to live the Christian life, so to speak, whatever you want to call it, to be part of the body of Messiah to do his will in the world, to preach the gospel of salvation, and to carry on in a way that we know it's not about us. You know, he even tells, Yeshua even tells the people, you know, they're going to persecute you. They're going to come and arrest you. They're going to drag you into the synagogue. They're going to drag you into jails. But don't worry about what you're going to say in your defense. Because the Ruach is going to take care of it. This is the power of the Spirit. This is the only way we can be disciples. We surrender, we deny ourselves, and we live in the Spirit. Paul talks in Romans and Galatians so eloquently about either live in the flesh or you live in the Spirit. And the Spirit and the flesh are always at war. And if we're left to our own devices, the flesh will usually win. <laughs> the flesh will usually win. So by the power of the Spirit, we can do this. We've been called to this. And I, I got this picture of the wheat because there's a huge harvest. But like Yeshua says in the gospel, Matthew uh, 9 and a few other places, the harvest is plentiful, but there's so few workers because nobody wants to go out and do the harvest. Nobody wants to go out and do the work. Nobody wants to go out and bring in the harvest because it's hard work. But as disciples, that's what we're called to do. And sometimes it might be nice and sometimes it might be easy and sometimes it might be very difficult. And sometimes it might even, it, it might even change everything about the way we live. But we're called to do this. And again, as I, when I, we started, I said, the time we're living in, we're here for such a time as this, as my friend Jeff was talking about during the, the, the worship part of the, of, of the conference, we're here for such a time as this. Book of Esther, you know, in Acts 17, Paul tells the, the philosophers at the Areopagus that 
we all came from one blood. We're born when we're supposed to be born. We're in the place where we're supposed to be. I'm paraphrasing, of course, for a reason. And so the gospel is urgent. Preaching the kingdom is urgent. And moving in the power of the spirit is the only way to accomplish this. Discipleship is not something we can do easily or of our own power. So, so thanks for listening, and I'm glad you tuned in, and I hope you got something out of it.